jolted into activity. Yes? So there's also an addiction to being active as well that's going on. And that's more of an emotional addiction now, isn't it? Of needing that kickstart to be active, and that way when you're active you can be feeling like, oh, let's get up and do things, I feel powerful, and, 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 uh, and we've now just ignored the state that has been created through the, the coming back to our body every single morning. That's just an example. Now, the same person wakes up in the morning and there's no coffee. What happens now? Well, for most of the people where there's no coffee and they're used to the coffee, they go into anger. And what, what do they... Who's responsible for the shopping? <laughs> Why haven't you bought the coffee? What's, what's going with the coffee? And the anger is always the response, in this case, of the addiction not being satisfied. Now, let's define anger as also frustration, annoyance, irritation, and all those kind of emotions are all an indicator that our addictions are not being satisfied. In fact, it, you can use these emotions as a way to tell you things. So as soon as you feel any even irritation, you go, oh, okay, another addiction's underneath here. I wonder what that one is. Yeah. You might not know what it is at that point, but at least you know that it's there because the irritation, the annoyance, the frustration, the anger is telling you it's there. Right? And those emotions will always tell you that it's present. We, you had a question up there? So we can just have the mic back there. Thanks. So that means anytime you're irritated, so you're standing in line and there's five people ahead of you. And, and you're you irritated. Feel irritated. There's an addiction that's not being met. Exactly. So, so there are those things that so, we don't. So, look so at. let's use the example. We're standing in line, five people, and what do we start doing? We go, they haven't got enough people serving, don't we? So what are we starting to do straight away? We're blaming another person for the irritation that's been created, not understanding that our very soul placed us in the location, five people down the line, <laughs> waiting for somebody to come and serve us. And our very soul put us there, so our very soul must need to heal something here for to put us there. So yeah, there's something inside of my condition that's drawn me to this situation and circumstance. And instead of going, oh, what's inside my condition? I'm annoyed or I'm irritated. What am I irritated about? I'm not being served. Why am I irritated about not being served? What fear do I have here or what grief do I have here that I'm covering over with this addiction that I want service right now? This is a big problem in America, by the way. Mm -hmm. You are so used to getting served very well that when you go to another country, what happens? You often get very annoyed, mm -hmm. yes, because uh, it's not the same level of service Even that you're used to. Even different parts of the country. Like exactly. You're, you're north and you go down south and they're a little slower. Now a bit more relayed back. Yeah, and you're like, what the what heck is going on? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and then what we do is we start projecting this outwards, which is a very unloving act now. Now we're starting to project our anger to a person, to the service people, to the... And, and to be honest, if somebody was angry with you, would you serve them? Well, I don't know if I would. So how can you expect to get served by being more angry? You really can't, can you? And of course, that's going to have its own compensatory effects upon your soul the instant you start creating this. And it's all there to actually help us of, to get to the fear and the grief that's underneath our fear. That's what the whole event is happening for to help us to get to those particular emotions but what we do instead with it is we go oh no 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 this is not my fault this is the owner of this you know i guarantee tonight some of you are going to get into addiction with our with our you know mill 
Because, because, you know, when 40-something people rock up to a restaurant <laughs> all ordering the same kind of food or, or similar types of food, there's bound to be a problem come up that, uh, is that our soul attracts, yes? And uh, sooner or later, that event will trigger something emotionally. And what we do is we'll go, many of us will go, even after this discussion, we'll go into there, which is really into these feelings, right? Many of you will notice that and you'll go, okay, what's this all about? Now, what it can be about is quite simple. It could be just this feeling that I have inside of myself that I should get my needs met whenever I want them met. Now, many of us have been taught that, that we should get everything we want when we want it. Many of us bring up our own children to do that and we create little monsters rather than little children because they are all going walking around with these huge expectations that I want... Where's my iPad and where's my iPhone and where's my, you know, all these addictions are all present because we keep giving and feeding them. We keep giving everybody what they want, right? God doesn't give you everything you want. Have you noticed that? I wonder why he doesn't give you everything you want. Thank goodness he doesn't <laughs> give us everything we want. <laughs> now, he has the potential to give you everything you want. So there must be a reason why he's not doing it. And it can only be a reason to do with a lack of love inside of ourselves. So when we notice this happening, we need to see that there's an addiction in play. And once we can see there's an addiction in play, then we have this ability to start looking at what is underneath the addiction. The way you do that, though, is not intellectually. So what a lot of people do is they go, OK, I'm irritated, I'm irritated, I'm irritated. Why am I irritated? I don't like feeling irritated. Um, oh, I'll just put a smile on my face and go, how you doing? Um, would you please be able to serve me soon? Like, instead of actually deal with the emotion, right? we, 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 we try to act our way. And I say act purposely because that's what we're really doing. We're acting differently to how we feel. How we feel is... Give me the bloody food right now. That's how we feel, right? But we're not acting that way because it's not appropriate. It's not acceptable to society to act that way. So how, so what do we do instead? We just put on our pretty face while all this emotion is coming out of us, that other person, right? <laughs> and, and it's just coming out of us like, ah, ah. And, 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 we're like this at the same time, and like trying to maintain that at the same time. And then we're wondering why the other person's not responding very well. And the reason why they're not responding very well is because, of course, they can feel all of this stuff coming out of us, not that. And, of course, that's what their soul is going to be responding to, the, the feelings that are coming out of us, not, not what we think we, we, we're portraying to them. So when we do that, we're now in this facade, we're now acting. And, of course, when you start acting... What do you find? Things don't go as well, generally, as what you had hoped. And that's definitely usually the case with most of these situations. Instead, what we need to do is we need to stop for a moment. And even if it meant walking outside and getting to be last in the line again, rather than projecting all of this unloving crap at other people, we need to then feel about why am I so irritated? The way you do it is this. If the emotion is that you feel is irritation, then what you do is you sit down and you feel irritated. You don't go, oh, I'm, I'm irritated. I can see I'm irritated. You actually sit there and feel irritated. Right? You've removed yourself from the environment so nobody else needs to feel the terrible projections coming out of you and you're sitting there feeling the feeling. You know that it has to do with an addiction not being met. So what you try to do then is feel the addiction. You don't need to tell yourself about the addiction, you just feel the addiction. The way you feel the addiction is feel irritated as much as you're able and the addiction will rear its ugly head soon afterwards, if you allow the feeling of the irritation to just be with you, the addiction will become present soon afterwards. 
Once the addiction is present, you can feel the addiction. Does, it, does anyone know what it means to feel the addiction? I badly want to be bloody served. <laughs> so that's feeling the addiction. Does that make sense? I want to be served and you're not serving me in the right time frame. So all this dialogue can be going inside of you while you're sitting outside on the curb, <laughs> letting yourself feel what's going on. You could feel this, oh, I want to be served, what's going on here? What, what, and, and feel that frustration, let yourself feel it. Stop telling yourself that you don't have any. Stop telling yourself that everything's fine. Stop telling yourself that you're going to be a nice, loving person while you have all of these emotions coming out of you because that's all just fake stuff that needs to be thrown away from your life, really. You need to let yourself feel what's really there. Yeah, can I add yeah. to that? Yeah. yeah. What I've found is that initially there's all the facade, as in... I'm not actually angry I'm, or I can talk my way out of this anger by just understanding the whole... So it's facade and I'm trying to be very nice, so the place that AJ is describing. Then um, I feel there's another place that we go to where we go, no, I'm angry and I have a right to be angry because this is wrong and these are the two places we kind of live in in most of our life. We go either, no, I'm not angry, I'm a nice person and anger is bad or actually I am angry now and I should be able to be angry. And the other person deserves my anger. They're doing the wrong thing. Any rational person would see that this is a bad situation and I should be able to be angry. What it's like for to actually experience an addiction and release it is to let yourself, as AJ said, really want the thing that you want. So, like, we often relate it to a physical addiction, like coffee or a substance or something or a food, because it actually does feel. If you've ever craved something that you can't have physically, it feels like a very similar feeling when you can't have an emotion, emotional addiction met. Mm. It's it feels like no, I want you to validate me as a person. I want to feel like a special person. I want you to make me feel safe in this situation. That kind of feeling. That's what it's like to experience the addiction emotionally. It's very painful. You feel like there's a deep need in you that is not being met. And, and maybe if we compare it with like it's the same process as if let's say you're addicted to coffee in the morning. You would just sit there with the coffee cup right there <laughs> brewed. <coughs> right, smelling it, smelling <laughs> all up there. Right, so you just sit there and you just look at the coffee cup and feel like how much you want that coffee, <laughs> right? And just feel how much you want it without actually taking it. You see, and and this is why I say that dealing with addictions is the biggest work you're going to do on this path because, especially in the West, we have so many addictions. We are t and we are totally grown up with the feeling that they're normal and that's normal life and you should be able to get things and when we don't have like it's we're so adverse to the pain of not having that thing that it, that's why we always put anger on top of the addiction level <laughs> of, of what happens because most of us just get angry and it's actually being brave enough to go through the pain of, like, of the anger. Because the anger actually, when you're, when you're owning the anger, it feels very painful. Like, no, <laughs> it's a hurting kind of anger. Mm. And then, then there is the feeling of recognising emotionally. And this is why AJ really stressed the emotional part of it. Because many people, when they learn this little flow chart, they go, OK, I'm irritated. What am I afraid of? And then we can tell ourselves a really big story of that kind of, feels okay for us of what we might be afraid of or the grief that we might have something we might have missed out on in our childhood and it's just a totally intellectual exercise i've tried it it totally doesn't work and most of the time you've come up with the wrong thing it's yeah. usually completely in the wrong field ballpark or even in the wrong universe <laughs> yes. <laughs> that far away? yeah 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 uh, and it's only been through feeling this feeling of I really want what I want and then the pain of, oh, I can't, if I'm going to be loving, I can't get what I want. And that's an emotional place as well. Because intellectually, we know at the beginning, I'm angry, okay, I know that's not loving. We, we, know the, we know the talk by now, most of us. But 
but getting to an emotional place with this process is firstly feeling the pain of I want what I want and, and then the pain of oh, if I want God or if I want to be loving, I can't get this thing that I really want. And once those two things are actually experienced, then we get closer to the fear. Mm. Not before then. And that's why it's so important, this, this bit, I feel. Yeah. yeah. So um, maybe if I ask you a few questions about your own progress in the last four years. I feel like I've got a PhD in addiction. <laughs> so <laughs> AJ kind of lived his life very ethically and morally, so he didn't have that many. <laughs> oh, I had a few. But you had some, but They but all not seemed like to me. get squashed when my entire life fell apart and nobody wanted to spend any time with me anymore. <laughs> so you grieved them <laughs> all at once. I had to grieve them all at once. Yeah. But... Uh, um, you know how you said how early you said how the your addictions have been the biggest work you've had to do. Um, can you give an illustration of some of those particular things that that where you've noticed them where you where you had physical addictions associated with emotional addictions and then what what actually got triggered in your life and how they come out? Uh, yeah, mm. yeah, and what I've realised is. Every single physical addiction I had was really just a mask for a deep emotional addiction that I had. So, um, in the beginning, I had I, w I had I was addicted to coffee, uh, food, and I didn't mind the occasional drink or three either. So, <laughs> all of these things to help me kind of numb out and get away from myself. Um, you and also kept yourself quite busy most of the time, didn't yes, you? Yes, I liked exercise, I worked a lot, I was also studying a master's and, yeah, and all of these things were quite socially acceptable in the sphere I was in. Um, everyone went to work, started their day with coffee and then we were all busy all day and then we, you know, talked about what we were studying and, the, you know, so there was a lot of, um, mm. it was all seemingly socially acceptable but it really was the basis of my life. Then I met AJ probably and um, realised intellectually, hmm, there's a lot of things off and I don't actually know myself and I can't actually feel myself. Uh, and so then I started the process and even just through engaging a relationship with him, obviously most of my addictions were challenged uh, emotionally now. So because underneath all these physical addictions I had, a, I think I uh, shared with the group in Gothenburg, my four major addictions were... Um, being approved of. So I got a lot of that fulfilled through my lifestyle um, and my family unit. Um, so when I met AJ, um, my whole basis for my life was kind of challenged and my family was very challenged. So immediately, approval was very challenged. Everyone I knew kind of went, what's happening with you? You're a bit weird. And my family went, if you go down this path, we can't accept you anymore. So that was approval out. Uh, do you remember all Safety was another mm -hmm. one. Mm -hmm. Control. And a feeling of basically, which is related to control, it's about sanity really. And this is probably the one I'm still working through. <laughs> I really think it's not an addiction to feel sane. I like that <laughs> one. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, anyway, um, I should probably clarify that. <laughs> anyway, um, She's totally insane. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's my fear. Yeah. Uh, so I guess in giving up, I gave up uh, alcohol, coffee, chocolate. Oh, well, chocolate, okay, that's still on the way out. But uh, <laughs> alcohol and coffee were out the window pretty quickly. But what was left over was all this feeling like I need to be in control of my life. I need to feel safe. And I want, I, I, now that my dad has left my life, I really want you to make me feel like I'm okay in every way as a woman. And so lots of things happened there where obviously that addiction wasn't being met in the way I wanted it to be, which was very controlled. Um, and so lots of anger. Just That's why we always talk about how angry I've been for two years because really that was me just engaging this process. And um, I see that there's a lot of... Um, like I feel quite lucky actually that my soulmate is Jesus. And so when I met him, he really challenged every single addiction I had. And he it kind of, because I wanted to be with him, that forced me into this process that I f see lots of people kind of dancing with. 
and that they talk about, oh, I can see this addiction, I'll challenge that one. And I can see their whole life and I go, well, would you like, like we could, I could sit down and tell you what I can see is really controlling your life. Um, but you'd probably be incredibly challenged and, you know, just as I was and be angry for a couple of years. Um, mm. So that's the level of commitment I think it takes is being willing to see it in every sphere of your life. Mm. Yeah. yeah, is that kind of what you're asking? Yeah, because yeah. it's quite good sometimes to res- to hear practical circumstances, and and it's like um, with, for example, with the safety issue. Mm-hmm. Of course, when Mary met me at that time, her parents were attacking me. Um, it was soon after her parents were attacking me, and um, she was worried about public perception so much that. Here's a guy who's saying he's Jesus. He's not going to, in her mind, he's not going to attract very nice people around him. And I think all of you are lovely, so I I don't know whether that's true. (laughs) I I think you're all beautiful now. (laughs) (laughs) Not that I didn't before, but I was worried. Mary's original opinion was he's not going to attract very nice people. Uh, They're going to be people who want to attack him all the time and and, uh, pretty annoyed with him all the time and so forth. And and, uh, which is basically just transposing what my parents felt yeah. about him onto everyone. And yeah. so I wasn't... Just my existence didn't make her feel safe in her life. And so then it was like, how can you control me so that your existence was safer, wasn't it? Like, yeah. So there was all sorts of things there. So if we started... We, let's say we were home and we started having a conversation... Um, with a group of people and they start asking me questions about what it's like to live in the spirit world, Mary would say, who wants a cup of tea? <laughs> like right at that moment, you know, the critical juncture where somebody's <laughs> just asked the question and all of a sudden Mary's going, like, Where, where's a cup of tea? What do you want? You know, and of course everyone would get totally distracted, which was, which really? was the reason why she was doing it, of course. And and then I would bring that up and say, Mary, you're doing the same thing again. And then, of course... And then there's <laughs> the pain. I really want to w- have what I want. Yeah. 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 And so that's the time to feel the addiction. How much you want it. Yeah. Right? How much you want it met. Yeah. How badly it's... It, how, how it's right there in you and you just want it so badly met. And, and if you allow yourself to, to just sit with that feeling... You will actually feel it. You will feel that addiction. And wh- as you feel the addiction, what will happen is that you'll start feeling the emotion of the addiction itself, like how, wha- how badly you want it. And the why you want it that badly starts coming up with the feeling. It just does as soon as you really engage yeah. that process. So, yeah. and, and this is a, bu- a fundamental principle that we need to understand with all of your emotions. Feelings are over the top of feelings. Now, that might sound like a funny statement, (laughs) but many of you think that thoughts are over the top of feelings. And in between feelings. And in between feelings. And you believe you can think your way into your feelings. And you can't. You can only feel your way into your feelings. You can't think your way. So, so while it's important for you to understand when your feelings are illogical, because that's very important to understand, and we'll talk about that in a minute a little, it's import- more important for you to understand that above, over the top of your fear are the feelings of your addictions. Over to- top of your grief is the feelings of your fear. Not thinking about your fear, but feeling the fears. And over the top of the fears are the feelings of the addictions. And if you do not get the addictions met, you will also have another feeling, which is this. The anger, the irritation, frustration, which is another feeling. They're all feelings. If you tell yourself that you can think yourself into your fear, and many of you attempt this, and, and uh, if we be more accurate, many of the men in the audience think that they can avoid their grief, and they can't. And many of the women in the audience think they can avoid their fear, 
and they can't. So what we try to do is this. We see our addiction here, here. We don't feel it. We, we see our addiction. And then we go, okay, that addiction is there because, ah, oh, yes, I can sort of feel that little bit of that feeling of that fear. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to skip over that fear altogether and just cry about something. And do you know what you'll be actually doing? You won't be crying about anything to do with what created your fear. You will actually be crying about not getting your addiction met, which is actually more of an anger than a grief. Yeah. And then, of course, in that place where you're avoiding your grief and you're avoiding your fear, now you get a heap of spirits over the top of you as well going, yeah, 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 let's get into that. And now you've got lots of lots of spirits around you all encouraging you to avoid these emotions. And why are they encouraging you to avoid those emotions? Because they're the emotions they use to control you. And they want you to avoid those emotions because while you avoid those emotions, they are able to control you. Right? And in your anger, they can control you. And in your frustration and annoyance and irritation, they can control you. <laughs> but when you're actually in the experience of the emotion, now nobody around you can control you. Now you have self-determination. Now you have control of your own life. So this is important to understand. Just swap them, uh, thank that'd you. Be good. Oh no, it's just muted, I think. Yeah, the battery's there. Okay. I'll give you two clicks. Fire away, Chris. Can you hear me now? Yep. Okay. Um, I recently made a decision to leave my marriage mm -hmm. and I moved out of the house and it is challenging one of my biggest addictions of having a man to make me feel safe. Yep. Um, and so living by myself, I feel tremendous amounts of fear. Yes. Um, so my question is, do I just continue to engage the fear daily and feel it and eventually that I'll fall into my grief? Yes. Or am I really just s trying to stay in the fear and not feel, like Mary said, that, that trap door? Well, if you feel about the events that have happened recently for yourself, you can see how there's still this tendency to try to want another man yeah. to get the fear yes. met. Does that make sense? Right. So if you, if you allow yourself to think about that, you've got the fear being triggered. The man is not meeting my security. I haven't a man around me meeting my security feelings and so forth. So that it's being triggered in that moment. What you hap what happened is you reverted back to trying to get your addiction met right. immediately. Yes. Right? This is a normal way we deal with our fears. We, mm -hmm. we go, oh, I can't feel that, I can't feel that. Let's go and get the addiction met now and, and then I'll feel good again. Right. And then when we feel good again, we feel like, oh, I've satisfied myself. Oh, I, I don't have that fear anymore. It, and, it's, and it's completely erroneous we obviously do right. have the fear we're just we're just calming it down with our addiction yes so so instead of doing that you start feeling the fear so you feel it and you'll feel it in your body mm -hmm. and if you really like let shaking. yourself you you yeah shaking you'll feel the fear itself your body will start shaking you you wake up in the morning feeling the fear every morning for a period of time see most people can't cope with that most people don't have the desire even to cope with that for any reason so what they do is they wake up shaking the first thing they reach for is a coffee coffee to calm them down the cigarette which will make that go away and you know all of these different things which will help them shut down the entire process if we instead of doing that we engage the process so we engage this process that God's led us to so we engage this process of feeling this fear and every day we persist feeling it so so let's say one week's gone past and every day that week we've woken up. That's how it has been. Exact one week. <laughs> one week, yeah, one week. One week's not very long, by the way. No, I know. <laughs> but when you're in fear, it feels, it feels like, like a, a long time. A yes? year. Yeah. So, you know, if we compare one week with the whole of our life, you know, it's not a very long period of time. And most people are not willing to endure fear for one week. That's the reality. You look at our society, most people are not willing to endure fear for one hour let alone one week, you know. So, so, and if you stay in this feeling of the fear and let your body feel it, 
you know, you start shaking and all these other things. And what do other people do? Well, they may try to make you feel better, but a lot of times when they start seeing this, <laughs> What's wrong what with do you, you feel? <laughs> yeah, drug them. You want them to stop, you know, they're triggering your fear, aren't they? <laughs> and so, of course, you want them to stop, right? <laughs> and, and, and as a result of that, you can't cope. Another person who's also in fear can't s cope with seeing you in fear. And so what they do is that all around you, they start going, why are you in fear? What's wrong? You need to go to the doctor. You need to sort this out. You need to go and get antidepressant medication, whatever is going on for you. And they get a lot, you get a lot of pressure on them, which, which instead of actually lessening your fear, even makes it more strong, obviously. And if you allow that process to continue, many of your fears actually will start coming up in the process just by you allowing yourself to feel it. Just one fear, you're feeling one, and now everyone around you is in panic of what kind of thing they're feeling, how it, how it affects them and all those kind of things, what you're going to do with it. And as a result, they become more traumatised and then there's extra fear that comes your way of now you're potentially losing relationships, losing friends. All these things come up automatically because we have so much society-based pressure to be nice and safe and calm. Right? And it's also bringing up so many of my other addictions of course. by getting rid of this one major addiction yes all of a sudden i'm aware of all these other addictions exactly. and now i'm in fear about all of them uh, okay. on top of it yeah so. the fear time is a very unpleasant time i i must agree with you it's a very <laughs> difficult time to go through and many people endure a few days of it and then boom, they're out and back into their old life again because they don't want to go any further than that they don't want to actually feel their way through it all. The, re the reality is if you've had, say, 30 years of life, let's say, and in that life, in those 30 years, some quite emotionally fearful events must have occurred, right? If you think about your life. And depending on where you live, some of you have lived in other countries that are, you know, potentially even more fear-based fear soci societies or, or the fear has been expressed outwardly more, then potentially there's, there's quite a lot of fear inside, right? So, so there's 30 years of this life. Do you think that 30 years of fear is going to be able to be felt in one week? No, no, I guess that wasn't my expectation. It no, 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 it's not yours. I felt um, as a result of feeling all this fear yep. and also a desire to not want to engage my addictions any longer, yep. that I feel almost shut down emotionally that mm. I can't cry about it yeah you know but what I mean? you're yeah. shut down emotionally because you're not feeling your fear okay yeah. and and that's what I wanted to say I feel that between this point and this point the true transition there is a kind of grief <laughs> and for me it's kind of like a grief of it's surrendering the old way which is this way <laughs> And it's an emotional realisation that's not going to work anymore yeah. and, and that I'm going to have to go this way. Right. And that's the biggest decision I think any of us ever make. So maybe that's where I am instead <laughs> of in the fear that I've I'm in that in between. Yeah. yeah. I don't feel you've grieved like letting go of addiction as a – it's like a um, – what does it feel like to me? Like a fallback position, you know, or like a last resort phone a friend <laughs> <laughs> I'll just go back to addiction <laughs> you know yes there's a point where there's a grief where you or a, or a pain where you realize I can't do that anymore and the only way left is down this rabbit hole mm -hmm. and and that is a very scary painful place mm -hmm. and most of us I feel and what I did for a long I feel I'm actually at this place right now this gut r grinding wrenching I have to go this way because it's too painful to go this way yes. anymore. Um, but for a long time, I danced between these two places. Yeah. Touch a bit of fear. Oh, I'm processing fear. It's oh, okay. But next thing you know, I'm right. back in an addiction. And it kind of... I, I can I, feel I myself like wanting to go back to addiction. Yes. Just wanting it. And, that and uh, like I said, you know, even in the last few weeks, you, there's been times when you have. Yes. Right. So that's an Very indication... Much. 
And as Mary's saying, when you fully grieve the addiction itself, when you fully feel it and grieve it, you will get to a point where you acknowledge the fear and you want to feel the fear itself. Mm, okay. At that point is the time when you'll start feeling the fear properly and you will not revert to addiction. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes. You, in, when you get to that place, you won't go back to the addiction, so you won't cycle. Because my it's soul like has it's made like that decision. It's Your not an option choice, anymore. Yes. Th yeah. Those two, it's gone. Okay. Yeah. And you're just sitting it on the cliff face going, <laughs> oh... You know, it's like standing on a cliff face, <laughs> diving off and then wondering what's going to happen. Yes. Like, And that sensation, you know that sensation you have physically sometimes of falling? Yes. You know how some, some people feel quite freaked out about that sensation, like when you go on a theme park ride or something like that and you have mm -hmm. that sensation. And that's the sensation emotionally when you actually confront the fear. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes. It's like an emotional realisation that that's what you've got to do and you've got no idea how it's going to turn out. Yeah. Now, most people want to have an idea of how it's going to turn out. This is why we That's ask a lot addiction. of questions. <laughs> yeah. This totally. is why we ask a lot of questions about our emotional process because we actually want to know in advance what it's going to feel like before we feel it. I very much do. I know that. Yeah. And then we'll be safe. And of course, safe control fear always. didn't get in you because you were safe. It got in you because you were unsafe. Mm -hmm. So you're going to feel unsafe processing it. That's the reality. You are going to feel it. Pain, the pain of fear is going to be certain. You're going to f have to feel it and it, it's going to be a certain pain that you definitely feel. You can't avoid it. And, and when we talk about it all the time, we're avoiding it. Right? We're, we're attempting to use words to try and make ourselves feel, ah, 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 now I can handle that. Right? When, when the reality is to feel fear, you've got to feel like you can't handle it and actually go through that feeling. So, so it's actually counterintuitive what we're trying to do. You see we're that? choosing to feel out of control. Yes. yes. Yeah. You we're choosing to feel out of control by feeling our fear. And everything inside of us is screaming at us, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that. And yet we still do it. And once you get into that place where you choose to do it, you will never revert to your addiction again. Does that make sense? Never. You won't be drawn back into the addictive behaviour again. So, f for example, with regard to this thing with men, you will never enter into a relationship again with a man after you choose to feel this fear. You might not have felt it all fully yet, mm -hmm. but once you choose to feel it, you will never enter a relationship with a man again based on wanting safety, ever. That seems very worth it. Well, it's definitely worth it, isn't it? Because then, it, uh, obviously, it's going to have to be based on some other things, like sex or other... No, no, no. <laughs> on my other addictions. <laughs> yeah. yeah, other addictions. <laughs> what we need to do, obviously, is we deal with the different addictions, right? And then, and then what happens is we have a pure desire that comes out of us to love. And that, that of course, will then drive all of our actions. That's and the help beauty. attract our soulmate. Of course. It will it attract our soulmate. We have a longing for our soulmate during, uh, during that process as well. And, and I see, you understand too, that while this fear exists within you, desire will be very difficult. In other words, you will not even feel your desires correctly mm -hmm. while this fear is within you. Because unfortunately, while it's within you, it's screaming at you going, meet my addiction, meet my addiction, meet my addiction, meet my addiction. And as it's doing that, this constant meet my addiction thing with you, What's happening is you don't have any space left inside of you to feel a desire. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. But when you let go of this fear, all of a sudden, the amazing thing about it, you don't even have to have felt it all yet. You're just even acknowledging its existence. You start also noticing desires that you had that you never noticed before. Things that are a part of what you want to fulfill in your life that you never even thought about before. Mm -hmm. And the reason why you never thought about them, because to even to think about them caused you to be afraid. And so you didn't even want to think about them. And this is what I'm saying. It's the soul's feelings that control even what you think about. For many of, many of you are yet to engage your pure desires because your fear prevents you from even acknowledging what they are. That's the irony. Yeah. Yeah. And, and this is where why fear is such an important emotion to address emotionally. 
Because if we don't address it, we'll never know what we truly want. Mm. Yeah. Do you want to say? Uh, just that that's been my experience, absolutely. And um, just by almost, almost making, I'm on the decision point of fear and there's no way back, all this desire has just rushed into me for life and living and a kind of joy that I have I can't remember having for 33 years um and yeah it's just a very beautiful place even though it's gut-wrenching there's this this energy in me that wasn't there before this joy and and I feel the magic of this place is because desire starts to come then, if we act on those desires, then it h helps us in the fear process as well. It'll trigger the fear, but also there's a joy in doing a desire that's more pure now. And yeah, so it's worth it. <laughs> yeah. And where I see...